Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Nano Talks. Uh, this Nano Talk is a recording of another uh, liquid phase electromicroscopy user webinar we did with Dr. Joe Pedersen, who is a user of both the ocean and the stream system. In this webinar, he presented his work on macromolecular self-assembly and discussed sample preparation challenges for controlling solvent flow, mixing and temperature. Now we will switch to the recording. Uh, the presentation starts after a short introduction of the speaker and after the presentation uh, we will have a Q&A with the audience. So please enjoy this nano talk. Um, let me introduce our speaker to you uh, today. So uh, Joe Pedersen uh, is using uh, our both our liquid phase uh, systems, uh, ocean as well as stream. So he has a, a lot of uh, uh, experience on this. And last year also we wrote an article about his work on uh, self-assembly uh, of amphiphilic molecules. Um, Joe Pedersen is at the moment an assistant professor in the chemistry department at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, he completed his PhD in polymer chemistry and self-assembly at the University of Warwick. He performed postdoctoral research at the University of California, San Diego, and he also worked uh, here in the Netherlands at the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Laboratory of Materials and Interface Chemistry. His research involves the development of new materials through deep understanding of their structural dynamics. To address challenges in this area, he has developed new liquid phase and cryogenic electromicroscopy methods. Uh, for his research, he has been awarded several prizes, including the Domino Macro Group UK Young Polymer Scientist of the Year in 2011, uh, in 2013 the John Weaver PhD Prize, and the Marie Curie Individual Fellowship in 2017. So, very warm welcome to Joe. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction and, and for the invitation. And thanks to everyone for, for showing up to, uh, to listen to my talk today. Um, so the, the title of my talk is uh, it's a description of how research happens in my lab, but it's actually also a description of my kind of overall uh, research trajectory. And, and that's really where I wanted to start because um, it gives a kind of overview of, of why I do research uh, in the way that I do. So as was mentioned, I did my PhD with, uh, with Rachel O'Reilly uh, and um, the expertise in that group are uh, uh, largely synthetically focused. And this is the first paper I ever published uh, almost exactly 10 years ago uh, to date uh, that it was published. And so it was the design and synthesis of these uh, functional uh, switching nanostructures. And so we made things like polymer vesicles that could change their morphology in response to uh, temperature. And at that point we were doing our analysis largely with things like static electron microscopy and dynamic light scattering. And so that was enough for us to prove that we'd made the kind of structures uh, that, we were, that we were aiming for, uh, but it wasn't really enough for us to get any detailed insights onto the self-assembly processes. And so consequently, in the kind of design portion of this research, we were using our intuition a lot. Uh, we had to think about what we anticipated what would happen uh, in order to design the polymers and how we would self-assemble them. And so to me, that was always kind of frustrating and I wanted to get more information on, on how these self-assembly processes uh, worked. And so after I finished my PhD, I spent about five years really just doing, I would say, dedicated microscopy, uh, developing methods like liquid phase EM to look at what would traditionally be uh, called more beam sensitive uh, materials. And so I did that working with Nathan Gineski, and I also did it in Eindhoven, working with uh, Nico Sommerdijk and Heiner Friedrich. And over the course of that kind of development, it became totally clear to me that the insights that we were getting from these experiments were more than enough for me to go back into the lab and redesign uh, self-assembly experiments to make different types of materials. And so recently, we just published this paper from my lab where I would say we've you know, really made a kind of new class of materials and also shown that we can use these as precursors to making self-assembled materials uh, in a way that would just never occur without having the insights from the liquid phase electron microscopy experiments. So that's kind of the story I wanna talk about today. It's why it's really important for us to close this intuition gap that we often have when we do uh, self-assembly 
And if we can understand how these processes work, we can go back in and, and redesign things. And so we do that in my lab for lots of different types of self-assembly processes. Today, I'm really just gonna focus on our work on liquid-liquid phase separation, but we work with many other different types of systems and processes. And in each case, we start off in the lab, uh, we synthesize some materials, we self-assemble them, and then we spend a lot of time on the microscope understanding that process. And then based on the information we get from that, we go back into the lab and we redesign our self-assembly. And so in order for me to kind of tell you about how that works, uh, I really need to introduce what self-assembly processes are and how the design of self-assembly processes uh, really takes place. So this is the IUPAC definition of self-assembly. Uh, the most important word for me here is spontaneous. So what that means is that self-assembly processes uh, have a negative free energy change. And so consequently, we often represent them uh, on a free energy landscape. So that's a representation of all the different possible microstates uh, that a system can take as a function of their free energy. And so self-assembly processes typically occur when you start in a high energy microstate. So in this case, that's these unassembled building blocks, these spherical building blocks. And then you transition to a low energy microstate. So in this case, that could be the formation of these trimers. And in this case, the self-assembly process uh, appears kind of uh, unhindered uh, because the energy barriers between the different microstates are less than the thermal energy. But in many cases, we will have these high energy barriers, uh, higher than thermal energy, we can't get over them, and we get kinetically trapped systems. And this is one kind of really important phenomena that, that's really difficult to understand intuitively is when do we go from a thermodynamically uh, driven assembly process to these kind of kinetically trapped uh, assembly processes. So that's how self-assembly processes work, but how do we design them? Well, I think about self-assembly as being a kind of high dimensional problem. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of variables that we have. And so I would say there are really six fundamental variables that we have in self-assembly. So we have the molecular structure of our building blocks. Uh, we have the medium where self-assembly takes place. We have the concentration of our building blocks in that medium and temperature, pressure, and volume. And I say these are fundamental variables because some of them you can break down into uh, more variables, um, but you have at least these six that you need to think about for every single self-assembled system. So the medium, for example, uh, if you're doing self-assembly in water, you could break this down into independent variables of uh, solution pH and ionic strength. Uh, molecular structure, for example, you could break down into really almost an infinite number of different variables. You know, today we'll talk about varying things like the length of a polymer chain. Um, but again, you know, you have many different ones, many different variables that you can choose from. And uh, I like to think about these as being a kind of high dimensional space. And here I'm representing three of those uh, dimensions. But again, this is really a high dimensional space. There are at least six, if not an almost infinite number of dimensions we can work with. And when we design self-assembly uh, strategies, what we're designing is the place we start in this landscape, how we transition through this landscape, and the place we end in this landscape. And so the important thing is each different position in this landscape gives us a completely different free energy landscape. So every time we make a movement through this landscape, all of the relative energies of the microstates shift in some way. And so because they shift, that is why we get a change in the self-assembled structures. And so this is why self-assembly is really complicated because we have to understand how our structures evolve as a consequence of this really complicated free energy landscape shifting, all these microstates changing their relative position as we move through this uh, space. And so kind of the, the thesis of my lab is that the, the design, the way we move through this space should change after we've made our observations uh, inside of the microscope. And so that's really what I wanna uh, focus on uh, today. So the first story I wanna tell you about is uh, the self-assembly of these block copolymers to form vesicles. And so the polymer we're looking at here is polyethylene oxide block polycaprolactone. And so we start the self-assembly process by dissolving this in a good solvent, so typically acetone. Both blocks are soluble, and so it's molecularly uh, dissolved, uh, as kind of represented here. 
And then as we add water to this solution, we're shifting, you know, we're moving through that free energy landscape by changing the composition of the medium. And as we add water, the hydrophobic portion, the polycaprolactone becomes more and more insoluble. And eventually that triggers the self-assembly of these polymers into these kind of higher order structures where eventually you can get uh, these vesicles. So in the lab, we typically do that by just dropping uh, water into these beakers. Um, but we also developed a method of doing this solvent exchange process inside the microscope. And I'll go into more details later. But for now, I just really want to point out that we were able to move through the landscape and initiate the self-assembly of these vesicles. And what you will see here by the end of this uh, video, uh, which is uh, 60 times real time, is that we have these very, very clear vesicle structures which are indicated by having this kind of membrane. And they were not present uh, in the beginning of the movie. So in this paper, we did uh, a ton of work on uh, quantifying uh, the self-assembly process. And I don't wanna go through all of the details of that, but I wanna highlight that it's there. So if you're interested in quantifying these kind of self-assembly processes, there's a lot of work in this paper um, that could be very useful to you. And what we were able to do is quantify the change in the size and the membrane thickness and the contrast of the vesicles uh, with time. And so we got a lot of detailed information about the pathway. And in order to extract uh, the thermodynamics and kinetics of these pathways with respect to this uh, trapping of metastable structures, uh, we actually uh, utilized uh, self-consistent mean field theory, which is a really good way of calculating thermodynamic pathways. And so the kind of um, the marrying of these two uh, types of data was enough to show us exactly when we transitioned from this thermodynamic pathway uh, into a kinetic pathway. And again, I don't want to go over all the details, but essentially what we found is this linear like behavior was a thermodynamic pathway and these deviations from linearity in this plot were the onset of this kind of uh, kinetic trapping. So that's a really, really interesting way of being able to understand uh, how you transition through the through this free energy, uh, evolving free energy uh, landscape. But what I more want to focus on is the overall kind of uh, self-assembly mechanism. So at the time when we were working on this project, there were really two proposed pathways in which building blocks could form vesicles, uh, colloquially kind of known as pathway one, pathway two, or mechanism one, mechanism two. The important point about these is both of them start off the same. So you have your individual building blocks and the first structure they form are these spherical micelle structures. And a spherical micelle, uh, you know, it's really represented in, in electron microscopy is it's going to be a small structure that has a relatively dense high contrast core. That's in comparison to the final vesicle we form, which is going to be much larger but it's gonna have a very low density core because the interior of this vesicle is very solvated. So these mechanisms differ by their intermediate state, but that's not so important here because the first state that we form is the same, it's these spherical micelles. The most kind of informative figure that we created in this paper um, to look at the full self-assembly process were these cross-sectional time series. So we were cropping out an area of the movie where a single vesicle forms. And at the end of the movie, you have this very clear uh, vesicle structure. And so we're taking a line profile down every single frame in the movie and playing that as a, as a single image, basically. So what we can see is at the very end of the movie, we have this very clear vesicle structure. So it's large, has this low contrast uh, interior. But as we look backwards to the origin of where this vesicle come from, what we find is that we begin with a structure that's actually quite large, and I mean, it's roughly the same size as the final vesicle, but it's very, very low contrast and it does not have a high contrast core. So what that means is that uh, the beginning structure here can't be a spherical micelle. This does not fit with the conventional models. It doesn't fit with our intuition about how the self-assembly process should take place. So consequently, we had to come up with, you know, really uh, a new theory, a, a new proposed mechanism for how these were forming. And so because what we observed was that the initial state was this large, low contrast uh, structure, this means that structure must be very solvated. And so our proposal was that the first state in the formation was the formation of these polymer rich liquid droplets. 
and then that the self-assembled structures, so these micelles actually appeared at the interface between those droplets and the environment, and they would go on to evolve in different ways in order to finally form this vesicle structure. And so you can see that here schematically, and you can see it here in the, in the snapshots uh, that we have uh, from those movies. So of course, this is quite controversial because you know, we, we're proposing a completely new mechanism uh, here. And the obvious question uh, that would be asked, and many people ask me many times, is uh, how is the electron beam affecting this process? Or indeed, how is the surface of our liquid cell affecting this process? And so the, the first answer, of course, is the electron beam and the surface play a role in all liquid phase EM experiments. And we did a lot of experiments, control experiments, to try and understand what that effect is. Uh, you can read about those in the, in the paper. But the really important thing I want to answer in this presentation is, are these effects significant? And what I mean by significant is kind of with respect to our conclusion. So the most important thing about the observation we made here is that we have this new liquid phase precursor. So if the electron beam effects are significant, that means they're going to be creating this precursor. It's not something that occurs outside of the microscope in the native state. But if the electron beam is not creating this precursor, and that is something that occurs outside the microscope in the native state, I would then say those electron beam effects were insignificant with respect to the formation of this precursor. And um, so this really gives a good opportunity to sort of demonstrate how we can deal with this kind of controversial data. So we made an observation. It was completely different to what we expected. And that allowed us to generate a new theory or a new mechanism for how these vesicles form. And then just to be really precise about this, what we said is that we believe these liquid phase droplets are forming because at a certain region within this high dimensional space, they're the most thermodynamically stable structure. But because we just transitioned through that region very quickly, they only form transiently in solution, but they're responsible for things like the size of the vesicle and the onset of these kinetic traps. So now we have that theory, we can use that to make a prediction about how other polymer systems will behave or how other kinds of pathways through this space uh, will give us different types of materials. And so if we go and test that prediction in the lab and that prediction comes true, then I would say that's very good evidence to suggest that those E-beam effects and the surface effects were insignificant. And again, I'm just talking about the significance with respect to the, the liquid phase droplets. So in the last couple of years, that's what my graduate student uh, Arne has been doing. He's been trying to test this theory and he's done it by building new types of polymers. We wanted to work with different systems. He actually built uh, three different types of polymer systems. I'm just gonna talk today about uh, the PMM8 peg block copolymers that he made. And then he was testing their phase behavior by dissolving them in organic solvents and adding different amounts of water so that we could have different samples for every single point uh, as we transition along that kind of uh, change in the solvent composition. Here's an example of some of the data that he generated. And generally what we found is three different types uh, of phase states. So in um, when we have very low amounts of water, so um, when it's mostly organic solvent, we often find these clear solutions. So that's completely what you would expect. Uh, you have it, the polymer is dissolved. Uh, when we have quite high volume fractions of water, we get these kind of blue tinted solutions often. And if we analyze those by cryo TM, what we find are self-assembled nanostructures, things like vesicles and these bicontinuous uh, systems. Um, but we also often find these intermediate phase states where we have this kind of gray, uh, slightly turbid solution. And if I were to take those and look at them on the optical microscope, what he would find is that we had these very large micron-sized liquid droplets. So in kind of the conventional theory of how these polymers should assemble into vesicles, there's no reason why these liquid droplets should be there. But in our sort of new proposed theory, which came about of observing the whole self-assembly process, uh, these are completely uh, explained. So Arne tested that with a lot of different uh, polymers. Um, he varied things like the polymer concentration, uh, the length of the PMMA chain, and of course the water composition. So really exploring quite a large area of, of this phase space. And in all cases, he was looking at what kind of state the, the polymer would be in. 
And so he created these phase diagrams. And so all of these kind of individual points, uh, different experimental uh, systems that he tested. And uh, these dashed lines that you see here are actually from uh, theoretical calculations, uh, which we derived uh, using uh, Gibbs free energy uh, calculations. And so what we found here is that we had quite a strong agreement between our theoretical calculations uh, and our experimental observations. So really what we would expect here is that this blue region, this is where all this liquid-liquid phase separation happens, uh, should be in between this red line and in this uh, blue line, which are the sort of critical water compositions for when uh, self-assembly occurs in red and liquid-liquid phase separation occurs uh, in blue. And so these are really kind of back of the envelope calculations. So the fact that they agree so well to me is uh, uh, was kind of surprising. But again, it builds a lot of confidence in the fact that our theory for, for what's going on here is, uh, uh, is, is correct. So with that in hand, uh, Arn also wanted to study the kinetics of how this phase separation process works. So he did this by preparing samples uh, directly in um, this uh, phase separated region and then studying how they grow and change uh, over time. And what he found is that you would go from having dissolved polymer to the formation of these nanoscale liquid droplets uh, to the formation of microscale liquid droplets and finally to a completely macroscopically uh, phase separated system. And one of the things we found here is that uh, the fusion of these droplets um, is one of the major ways in which they actually grow in size. And we were able to see lots of fusion events at the nanoscale uh, using liquid phase electron microscopy and also at the micron scale uh, using optical microscopy. So I think this is also really cool now that we're able to observe the same kind of phenomena over multiple length scales uh, using multiple uh, different uh, techniques. So with that information in hand, we can now go back into the lab and redesign how we assemble structures with knowledge of the fact that we have these liquid phase precursors. And so what Arn did was to create, uh, to prepare samples in this liquid-liquid phase separation domain and then transition them into the self-assembled domain to make different types of structures. So in our previous study, what we found is that if we have a nanoscale liquid droplet, we'll form a nanoscale vesicle. And uh, what we wanted to know is what happens if we have these micron-sized droplets or even the macroscopically phase-separated system. So if we have nanoscale droplets with this polymer, uh, we can get it to form nanoscale particles, such as bicontinuous structures or vesicles. If we have micron-sized droplets, uh, we can get it to form micron-sized polymer particles. And if we have a macroscopically phase-separated system and we add water to it again, we get a macroscopic pellet uh, of these self-assembled polymers. And if we look inside this pellet with scanning electron microscopy, uh, what we see is this hierarchical uh, porous structure. And so I think this is uh, really important. So all these different structures are coming from the same polymer, and they're really coming from virtually the same self-assembly process. We're going from organic solvent all the way to pure water, but all we're doing is basically waiting at different time periods during the specific region of the phase space in order to exploit the fact that this liquid-liquid phase separation process will occur over orders of magnitude uh, in, uh, in size. And so that, that's a really powerful way of using self-assembly to create materials of many different length scales. And it, it's a really simple way as well. We're not really changing anything fundamental about what we're doing. We're just using our knowledge of how the self-assembly process occurs. Kind of finally, the really interesting thing that, that Arn found is that if he, he takes out this kind of uh, coacivate layer after it's macroscopically phase separated, uh, he can actually pull polymer fibers out of this layer. And that's also really interesting because um, there are a lot of living systems that use these same kind of coacivate precursors to make fibers. So spider silk, for example, uh, the spider silk protein is first, um, uh, first undergoes liquid-liquid phase separation to form these uh, protein-rich liquid droplets. And then the spider uses those droplets as a precursor to spin silk out of. And what we're showing here is the kind of physical chemistry of that is the same. You know, we're not using proteins or anything 
but we can use these liquid phase precursors to spin fibers out of something which under other circumstances would form nanoparticles or microparticles or, or macroscopic uh, systems. So again, just a very, um, very powerful method which is opened up by knowledge uh, of this kind of precursor phase. So to kind of bring that back um, to this high dimensional space, uh, we really have this new way of making self-assembled systems or new way of designing self-assembled systems with knowledge of the fact that we have this region of the phase space um, that creates a different precursor that we didn't previously know about. So in my PhD, we would, I, I mean, I probably did these kind of self-assembly processes a thousand times in my PhD, and we would always have a continuous transition from the good solvent into the bad solvent. And that was really just, you know, the way that we did those experiments. But because we had this new insight, we were able to go back into the lab and redesign that pathway to take this non-continuous transition through the system so that we would go to a specific point, we will pause for different periods of time, and then we will keep going. And just that little pause in there is enough to get you all these different uh, types of structures, which I think is, uh, is really cool. And so this got me thinking about, you know, what kind of pathways should we take uh, through the system? And, and what, what I was thinking when I was thinking back to our work on vesicle self-assembly is we, we actually really got lucky. And what I mean by that is what we did inside the microscope was the same thing that we've been doing in the lab uh, for a long period of time. And so we took this continuous transition and we observed something new. But I think in most cases, if you take the same pathway that we take in the lab, what you observe will be consistent with these current theories because most of these self-assembly processes have been investigated for a really long period of time with many other techniques and our knowledge of them is relatively good i would say but what i think we have it, and and we should still do that i have to say because uh in many cases we will observe certain nuances or new things that we didn't understand and direct observation of a process i think is always really important but i think with these liquid phase electron microscopy experiments, we have the opportunity to actually take complex pathways which wouldn't make sense before. So we should be able to kind of move off these axes, start making multiple uh, changes to our structure at once and taking these you know, kind of weird pathways through the system. I think if we do that, we're much more likely to observe completely new phenomena which will um, enable us to make uh, new design changes to how we synthesize materials in the lab without directly observing what happens when you take a complex pathway, it would be very difficult to really elucidate what's going on using, I would say, bulk uh, scattering or spectroscopy or even kind of snapshot static microscopy. So it wouldn't necessarily have made sense to do these before, but now I think that we should make more of a, uh, an effort in order to do kind of weird things inside the microscope and see what happens. And with this, we'll really be able to push our current theories to the limits. And it's when you push something to the limit uh, that you tend to find uh, something out. So obviously our ability to do this is highly dependent on our ability to control the environment in the liquid cell. And, and that's really what I wanna spend uh, the rest of the time talking about is, is how do we create these environments and how do we manipulate them so that we can move through this space? And so, as was mentioned, I've worked with both the ocean and the stream system, and I think they're, they're both really great. And the uh, major differences between them are, I'd say the major difference I wanna talk about is, is how flow works. So in the ocean system, uh, we have this, uh, what is kind of referred to often as a bathtub uh, system. So I would say probably if, if any of you out there are working with these experiments right now, this is exactly how your holder will work. When you start to fill it up with liquid, you first fill everything around uh, your chips, and then eventually you get this kind of like diffusion of liquid into the central part where you're imaging, and you can flow out of these lines here. And what that means is you don't really have direct control of flow over the imaging area. So one of the really cool things about the stream is that they have the inlet and outlet directly on the chip. And what that means is that liquid will come in, it will flow directly over your window, and then flow out again. And so to me, uh, this is a really important innovation because for the first time, it gives us control over flow where we're imaging. And so that's what I wanna kind of demonstrate uh, to you now, um, the importance of this. And I should say, in addition to that, the stream also has these microheaters and we have these electrochemistry experiments. And I wanna show a couple of results 
uh, from the heating uh, as well. So when I first started in this area, I think this is true of a lot of people, you know, um, everyone's talking about these flow cells, you have these flow, you can flow in, you can flow out. And when you first get your liquid cell holder, <clears throat> you realize that, that it's, this flow cell is uh, not really uh, true at all. Uh, there's actually virtually no flow, as I said, uh, going across here. You can kind of demonstrate that with this little movie. This is the ocean system uh, being filled from being empty. What you'll see is the liquid layer comes in completely uh, isotropically around um, and fills the cell from 360 degrees around. And that's because we don't have any directional flow going on here. And so uh, that makes it really challenging to control really the, the contents uh, over the area that you're imaging. Just as a kind of sidestep, I wanted to explain how we actually did that solvent exchange process uh, in the ocean system for the vesicle self-assembly. Because uh, we kind of come up with a little trick, which is very useful if you want to mix liquids inside the, the microscope. So the first step is what I just showed you on the previous slide. We start off with an empty cell. Uh, we flow in our polymer in the organic solvent. And then the second step is kind of the trick. We actually throw in, flow in air. And what that does is it really removes the solvent from the lines and it removes it from this kind of bathtub uh, area here. But because the flow is restricted between the chips, you actually maintain this thin liquid layer between the chips and importantly over the imaging area. So when you then flow in your second solvent, so in that case it was water, what you actually do is you end up creating this kind of diffusion gradient between the first solution you mix and the second solution you mix. And that allows them to diffuse into one another and then uh, change the environment where you're looking. So that's great and it's good enough to sort of do that slow mixing um, but again, there's no real control over what's going on uh, where you're actually imaging. And the stream uh, provides that. And so uh, what I want to show now is a movie of the stream being filled uh, from dry to filled with uh, water. And I will say in most cases when we do this, the filling is almost instantaneous. Um, but in this one case, the surface chemistry of the window was such that um, Filling happened very slowly um, and we kind of trapped a bubble inside. But what you will see is that the, the cell first starts to fill anisotropically. Uh, so you can kind of see the bubble uh, coming in more from one side. And then eventually, uh, right before it fills, uh, you actually see this bubble fly out uh, of the cell uh, under the flow that we have in there. And I'm not sure how well this is playing. It's a little bit. Uh, shaky on my end, so I'm going to let it run a couple of times. But the really important thing I want to point out is right at the end of this movie, that bubble doesn't collapse into the center like it did before, but it actually flows out to one side. When I saw this, I was totally blown away because to me, this was kind of definitive evidence that we actually have flow over the imaging area, which I think is really cool. And one of the things we're trying to show in my lab now is that we can actually use this flow to do clean and reuse. So in certain circumstances, we can do some chemistry, we can make some materials, but we can flow with a high enough rate that we actually push everything out and we start again uh, with our starting materials. If we can get that to work, that would be massive in terms of uh, you know, being able to do more experiments uh, because as most people know that do these, the time consuming step is getting everything set up and getting it uh, in the microscope. So outside of that, actually, I think the other, you know, the, the really important part about having direct flow over the window is you know exactly what the concentration of your solution is. And I, I don't think that's as true with the conventional ocean systems because uh, when you're preparing samples in different ways, you can have evaporation, you have diffusion of different things. And just because your input of flowing in is sort of so far removed from where you're imaging, it is very difficult to really be sure what's going on. In the stream case, because we can just flow over, I know I've replenished with flesh, fresh solution immediately. I can be very confident with what my solution composition is. And so I think that was really important for these experiments where we were uh, also testing the capability of the stream to do uh, heating. And so we were looking at the uh, sodium hydroxide etching of these silicon nanoparticles uh, at different temperatures and looking at their kinetics in flask. So that's an experiment done in the lab where we measure the dissolution of these with uh, light scattering effectively. 
um, and comparing that to what we get in the liquid cell, uh, directly monitoring the, the dissolution of these. And so what we can see from the kind of in-flask experiments is that every time we increase the temperature by 20 degrees Celsius, uh, we have a roughly kind of order of magnitude uh, decrease uh, in the time it takes for these silicon nanoparticles to be etched from something which is in the hundreds of minutes time scale to something in the tens of minutes time scale to in the sub kind of 10 minute uh, time scale. And when we did these experiments inside the microscope, we found exactly the same kind of behavior. So at 20 degrees C, we have this hundreds of minutes time scale, 10 degrees C, uh, sorry, 40 degrees C in the tens of minutes and 60 degrees C in really just a couple of minutes. And here you can see the images from these different uh, experiments here. So although there have been quite a few uh, heating papers out with uh, different liquid cell holders, I think this is the first time anyone has shown a really kind of quantitative agreement of the change in kinetics as you heat something up. And again, to me, this is, uh, gives me great confidence that we have really good control over our environment in the liquid cell. And this is so important when we're trying to understand how these self-assembly processes uh, work. And to bring this back again to this kind of high dimensional problem, um, you know, every sort of innovation and uh, increase in control we have of our environment inside the microscope gives us the opportunity to explore a different or more complicated pathway that we couldn't do before. And that's going to allow us to uh, make new observations of different kind of uh, material assembly behavior and go back into the lab and sort of redesign our self-assembly processes based on that. And I think it's also worth kind of mentioning here, there is a, a current um, trend in science right now that high dimensional problems should be solved with things like uh, high throughput, automated uh, synthesis and analysis and machine learning. And while I think those are great and super useful, uh, we don't wanna overlook the fact that uh, being able to directly observe a process can provide insights that we're never going to get with those kind of high dimensional experiments. And, you know, as microscopists, we're kind of uh, very aware of that, that being able to see something is just uh, a massive benefit, basically. So the reason I really like working with uh, Den so closely is that they're really dedicated to precise control over this environment and sort of expanding this space uh, into higher and higher uh, dimensions. So with that, I would just like to finish up by thanking my group and uh, my collaborators. I would like to say a special thank you to Hang Long Wu, who did all of the electron microscopy work on the vesicle self-assembly. He's actually finishing up his PhD very soon, and he's looking for a postdoc. So if you want an outstanding electron microscopist uh, to work in your lab, uh, I would definitely get in contact with either him or, uh, or me. Uh, he's, a, he's a really great uh, scientist. I also really want to thank Arn Risby, who's one of my current graduate students at UCI. And again, he did really fantastic work on the uh, formulation and preparation of those coacervates and self-assembled structures. Um, he's continuing uh, along that line to kind of exploit our knowledge about these liquid-based precursors to make all different kinds of uh, materials. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Alessandro Ianero, who have been working closely on this project to do the theoretical modeling, uh, as well as Remco Tunia. And I wanna say a big thank you to everyone I work with at Den Solutions. Uh, again, it's great working with them. And if we didn't have the technology in order to do these experiments, you know, of course we wouldn't have any of the insight uh, we get from them. And um, yeah, I look forward to continuing uh, to work with you all in the future. And then finally, I would just like to thank everyone for coming to listen to the talk and I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. Thanks. All right, so uh, thank you very much, Joe, for, uh, for your presentation and um, for your information that you shared with us about your experiments and, and also about, for your positive words on our system. I think our engineers, uh, our R&D team will be very happy with that. Uh, we didn't prepare this, it's not scripted, so uh, this is uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, So we, we are getting a few, uh, a few questions in. 
Um, that's really nice to see. Um, yeah. Um, so before I had a question also from uh, for, from our product manager. So uh, liquid volume, as we know, is is one of the fundamental variables in uh, LPM research. So how important is it for your research to control the liquid thickness, uh, which defines this volume uh, parameter? Uh, yes, I mean, yeah, the short answer is extremely, uh, extremely important. Um, and we actually have a kind of uh, conflicting situation here. So from an imaging standpoint, we want that liquid layer thickness to be really exactly the same as the size of the particle that we're imaging. So that's going to give us the, the best images in terms of uh, signal to noise uh, resolution. Um, but from the perspective of sort of controlling the environment in terms of flow or mixing or diffusion, we actually want the sample to be as thick as possible because that's going to get us, you know, more to a situation that we're used to in the book. So we have these kind of two, uh, yeah, really antagonistic uh, problems there. And so uh, you really have to think about the specifics of what you care about most in order to determine what is the best liquid thickness for for my experiment so being able you know any additional control on that is uh is going to help you out all right yeah, and that's that's also why we have our uh, pressure-based liquid pump of course for the stream system to uh, allow users to influence the, the the liquid thickness um another thing i wanted to ask you is because you you mentioned ocean as well as stream and of course stream is our, our new system and we 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 implement a lot of innovations in that but also a lot of people are getting great results with uh, with ocean so can you maybe uh share like a few features and benefits of both systems for which application would you use for instance ocean also yeah so as you mentioned we you know we have both in my lab so i, I wanted to have both because i i think they are uh, both really useful um the ocean is uh is mostly great because it's so easy to use um it's really simple to train people. Um, they tend to pick it up uh, very quickly and you can make good reproducible cells, uh, no problem. Um, so I would say if you, you know, it's kind of like if you don't need the additional capabilities of the stream, it makes sense to use the ocean because everything is uh, simpler, quicker, easier. Um, whereas of course, if, if you want to do something, if you need this direct flow over the window or if you need to do heating, if you need to do electrochemistry, um, then, of course, you have to move to the, the stream. Uh, it's more complicated to deal with. Uh, it takes a little bit longer to get things loaded up, et cetera. Um, but it gives you those extra capabilities. So, yeah, that, yeah, for me, I think I would always have both of those kinds of holders in, in the lab, I would say. All right. So just buy both. That's the, that's the message. <laughs> and the, that's right. That's the right. Message. Yeah. Um, so we go to the to the attendee questions. The first one is from a, and he asked about what the thickness of the liquid film is. I, I think it was the the, the stream movie you showed. Um, one of yes. the, the ocean. Ocean. So um, I I also usually I say I usually work in TM mode. So in in, in TM mode we really need to keep things below a micron. Um, and um, so I think for the um, for the vesicle movie, it's probably something on the order of three or four hundred nanometers, something like that. But we really need to keep things below a micron. Uh, we actually have a, a paper coming out soon, uh, which is with uh, Heiner Friedrich and, and Hang Long again, where we have a, a new method of rapidly measuring the the liquid thickness, uh, which is going to be really useful because it's something that is. Uh, kind of elusive uh, to a lot of experiments. You know, commonly people use eels to measure the thickness, but in most papers, people don't quantitatively determine it, but we, we have a really nice method to, to do that that anyone will be able to use. So uh, when that paper comes out, I would definitely recommend people checking it out. But typically, yes, all of these liquid layers are, I would say, somewhere around the 100 to 500 nanometer uh, region. You can go if you go into STEM mode. You can go much thicker. There are examples of, of people doing that, but I, I tend to work in in that kind of regime. All right, thank you for that. Yep. Um, can you go to slide twenty? Um, there is a question of, and he asks, uh, how can we be sure that the incoming phase is the bubble and not the incoming liquid? 
Uh, could you correlate it to the different contrasts that we are recording in this movie? Yes. So yeah, in this case, um, we're in Brightfield uh, TM uh, mode. Um, so essentially, the um, you know the darker structures, uh, higher contrast. It, it means more material. Um, so in this case, I mean, we knew it was empty because we loaded it uh, completely dry. Um, and then when we flow in, we can see the the high contrast liquid layer uh, coming in. So of course, before we load it, it, you know, the thickness is still there. We just have gas, which um, is very low density, so hardly any scattering. Uh, when we flow in that liquid, very high density, that's when we get this uh, contrast, basically. And so you can kind of almost see it right at the very end. You can still see the the outline of the of the cell. Uh, actually, don't know if I can pause this video, but but right at the very end, you can still see the outline of that cell, which is then, uh, you know, again lower contrast because it's filled with uh, with liquid, basically. Yeah. So I just as a as a kind of tip for anyone doing these experiments, I mean, it depends a little bit on what kind of loading methods you decide, but taking these low magnification overviews of the cell is extremely important to do at the beginning and at the end of your experiments because that gives you the best overview of what my cell is like in terms of is it partially filled, completely filled, dry, or whatever else. So we always, the first thing we always do is low mag overview at the beginning, and then at the end, before we finish, we also do another one of these so that, so that we really know what the hydration state of our cell is. All right, I hope that answers the question. Uh, we have, uh, at the moment, a lot of extra questions coming in, so that's great. Um, the next question is from uh, Barbara. She was uh, wondering about the electron doses used in these experiments. And I think, yeah. Yes. Another question from Tanya was how you how how to how do you keep the dose under control? So maybe you can answer both of them. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, I guess the first thing to point out there. So there are um, uh, slightly different things people often mean by dose. So. In, in, a, in the electron microscopy community, when we say dose, typically what we're talking about is uh, the number of electrons per unit area per unit time. Whereas say in the radiation community, uh, they're more referring to the amount of kind of energy absorbed uh, by the sample. And so they're slightly two different things. So in electron microscopy, we can very accurately control the number of electrons per unit area per unit time. Uh, we control that with all of our sort of imaging parameters. And so generally, when we do experiments, we set everything up in terms of imaging uh, before we put our liquid cell in, and we calibrate the dose uh, using flat field images, uh, et cetera. And we tend to have sort of three different fixed imaging modes that we use. So this low mag overview, and then two higher mag uh, imaging modes that we use. And then when we're doing an experiment, we just switch between those preset modes. And so we always know exactly the uh, electron density per unit time that we're putting into our sample. But with respect to like how much energy is our sample absorbing, that is more difficult uh, because it depends on things like the thickness and the exact composition. So in the experiments where we're changing things like composition, it's very difficult to understand exactly how much energy our, our system is uh, absorbing. And we yeah usually kind of fall back on simple theoretical calculations, which are probably not as uh, good as they uh, need to be, uh, I would say. Um, but yes, in any event, this is kind of a, a really important thing that we think about uh, all of the time. And I, I didn't talk about it today. Uh, you know, often I go into lots of details about how do we understand exactly how the electron beam is affecting our sample. And so there are many experiments that we use to to do that, which I didn't go into. But those control experiments are really important, I would say. All right. Yeah. And if people want to uh, get into a more detailed discussion with you, of course, we can facilitate that uh, after this webinar. Mm -hmm. We're very happy to uh, to connect you. Um, and also, Barbara also wanted to let you know that she she uh, it was a very great talk. So congratulations uh, on your talk from her. Thank you. um, and so we have one last question. Uh, that's from uh, Paul Smith. So he says, "A great talk, Joe." Uh, can you comment on any confinement effects that can play a role for the liquid liquid uh, separated droplets? Yeah, it's a great question. So 
Um, yeah, confinement confinement is going to play a, a big role in a lot of liquid phase EM experiments. We often talk about that as a kind of negative, but it's also a positive. So there are a lot of uh, really cool ways in which living systems utilize confinement to make materials. And I think uh, we have an opportunity in the liquid cell to, uh, to kind of get more information uh, on that. With the liquid-liquid phase separation, the confinement was actually preventing those droplets from growing to a certain size. So uh, we actually did a couple of control experiments where we um, looked at the size of the vesicles that we would form uh, in the lab versus in the microscope. And then uh, what we found is that there was a shift in the distribution of those so that the ones we generally formed in the lab uh, were at a slightly larger distribution than the ones we formed in the microscope. And I think that was really because the confinement is preventing those droplets from growing large enough uh, before they then self-assemble uh, into vesicles. Um, so I think that was the, the main kind of effect that we found. But yeah, as I said, in all cases, I mean, we know just from you know general physical chemistry of surfaces that things in surfaces are not the same uh, as in the bulk. So it's always something we need to, to think about. All right, uh, thank you very much. One more question dropping in. Uh, Paul Smith says, uh, thank you for the answer. Um, and uh, I, will, I will give this last question also. So from Tanya, is there a way to actually measure the temperature inside a liquid cell? That's also a great question. So I mean, that that's more a question for Dens than I, than I think it is uh, for me. Uh, if you can get- Yeah, let me get- uh, uh, Let me get the expert there. in. So maybe Tyne can uh, can tell something about that. Tyne, are well, you? Uh... I will say from from our end, of course. So one of the things yeah. we are doing. So one of the things we can do is we can make systems that we know respond very differently to temperatures. So like we did with the, the silica etching experiments. So from my end as a chemist, I can design internal temperature probes, things that respond to different temperatures in different ways. And that's our way of kind of testing this. But I think on the hardware end, it would be great if we also had an internal temperature probe that we could really measure. But I mean, really in the in the imaging area or as close to it as possible would be would be fantastic. All right. Hey, Tain, how are you? Hey, I, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, all right. Uh, so maybe to comment a bit on that. Um, so the stream system has a as a closed loop feedback loop. So we measure and control the temperature ins inside the cell. So that is um, yeah, directly measured around uh, the liquid. Um, in the end, it would of course be great to be even more local to see like on the window what the actual temperature is. So um, yeah, we're looking into methods to, to also uh, measure there. Right, so thank you for that. Uh, Tyne is our MEMS engineer who has uh, been working on the, the heating uh, uh, stream chip. So Joe, uh, thank you very much Thanks. for your for your time. Uh, to all the attendees, uh, thank you for for your uh, for listening, for raising your questions. Um, tomorrow you will get uh, the recording, and if you have any more questions, let us know. If there are unanswered questions that I didn't see, we will answer them by email and I hope to see you next time. So uh, wish you a great day, Joe. Thanks, you too. And that brings us to the end of this nano talk. To stay informed about upcoming webinars, I invite you to follow our social media channels, LinkedIn and Twitter. I also invite you to sign up for our monthly newsletter in which we share interesting in situ research and technological innovations. I want to thank you for watching and hope to meet you at one of our next webinars.